Welcome back to another segment of Community Lens. I am Erica Jones here from Somerville Media Center, and I am joined in the studio with Mr. Danny McLaughlin. Hello, friend. Hello, Erica. Thanks for having me today. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. <laughs> Considering it's the dead of winter, I'm doing all right. I know. I know. You're, you, you've de-thawed from outside. You're in the warm studio. Um, you are the ever-fearless program director of Teen Empowerment here in Somerville, yep. and you are a man about town. Um, many people probably know who you are. Uh, for those who don't know, though, what what is your story and, and how did you even get to Teen Empowerment? I know that you grew up here in Somerville. What do you want to share, folks, about how you got involved with TE? So uh, it's, al it's always funny when you think about Somerville <laughs> being uh, four square miles right. and like being popular or being known in four <laughs> square miles. It's like, Cool. You're a household name. <laughs> I'm known in this small little speck of the earth, uh, but it's kind of cool. Um, definitely not all all the way known, uh, but sometimes you don't want that. Uh, but yeah, I, I, feel, I feel like I'm, I'm a pretty uh, yeah no, known name in the community um, through through my work of uh, activism. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, like you said, I'm the director of Teen Empowerment in Somerville. I've been doing that work for about 15 years now. So I actually came up as a youth from the program. Uh, I actually started in the Summer Cares About Prevention um, Youth Leadership Program, and I worked my way up as actually a part-time staff person at Teen Empowerment into a full-time position, into a lead staff position, into an interim director position, Gosh, yeah. into where I am now, where uh, we actually see I, I oversee more programs than my predecessor did. Wow. Uh, we, we actually have five to seven different programs uh, running where we're working with 40 to 50 Somerville youth, where traditionally our program had 10 to 12. Right. Um, so we, we've seen a lot of growth in the program um, as, as sure the years have gone on. And leadership as well. Uh, you know, I, I, I like to think uh, the leadership in the city. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I obviously like it to play a role in, in that. Yeah. Um, you know, we're really grateful to the mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, he's really helped um, support the program. Uh, in a lot of the ways, uh, financially and um, in his own presence. Right. So we really, the, the background of Tina Palmer, what got me involved was that actually, <clears throat> I graduated high school in 2001, and what a lot of people don't know about the early 2000s, or what a lot of people do know now, but we didn't know then, was that Eastern Massachusetts and Southern New Hampshire at that time were actually targeted by big pharmaceutical um, to try new drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, a drug that's very popular, or was very popular, known as Oxycontin. Mm -hmm. um, and what we didn't know as teens and young people in that area was that we were actually in, in experiment mm. um, for big ph pharmaceutical. Wow. And uh, what's interesting today, we, there's actually evidence that have discovered that they actually did target these areas specifically. And if our federal government actually had the courage they could sue big pharmaceutical. Maura Healy's actually doing it mm -hmm. um, here yep. in Massachusetts. Sue Big Pharmaceutical for wrongful deaths because mm -hmm. we lost an entire generation. Right. So I graduated high school in 2001. In that fall, my first friend died of a drug overdose. Wow. And then a month later, my second friend died of a drug overdose. And then a month later, my first friend died of a suicide. And then a month later, another friend died of a suicide. And then for the next really 36 months, it seemed like someone died every month. Um, and it wasn't just drug overdoses and suicides. Drug overdoses, suicides. Um, my neighbor was murdered in 2004 after the July 4th firework celebration. Um, and he was, real, he was an innocent person. Um, he was a kid walking home, intervened in, in a conflict that was happening with someone's uh, brother that he knew. Um, <clears throat> and ended up becoming the victim of, of, of a stabbing. Uh, and for me, that was a point where I was uh, very young at that time, just got out of high school, a couple years out of high school, uh, probably about 21, and I had the sense of hopelessness that some of all, because my experience here was that you die. Right. Like that you grew up in some of all and, what you saw around and you, you. What's, yeah. what's hopeful here. Mm. And it really had that, we, we had the negative attitude, we, we had the feeling of that it's just, it's just, it's not good to be from here. And, and if you're a kid from here, you don't count. And at the same time, some was being gentrified. Right. So influx of money, influx of new residents, influx of all different types of actual opportunities that were coming, but they weren't necessarily for us, so we didn't see them for us. Right. Right. Um, so in that time, that built a lot of frustration. Um, <clears throat> maybe there were levels of jealousy. 
um, you know, you're, you're a teenager and you don't see it that way, but it's like you kind of see your neighbor now has all these things that you don't have. Right. Um, and your life is a struggle there. And I remember at this time I was working at MIT and I was a custodian. So I was cleaning up after kids. I remember going there on a Saturday morning, Sunday morning, and cleaning up vomit in the hallway of a kid that partied all night. Mm -hmm. And I would come from a funeral a few days before. Juxtaposition of just And that. now I'm here at MIT, and I'm cleaning up after this kid who's having, I mean, what he thinks is the time of his life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not necessarily true. Right. But they're living this kind of life and having fun, and I'm living this life of tragedy and struggle. And I, I kind of just accepted that that's what being an adult was, and that that's what life is. Uh, and I, I didn't realize that that so what was that pivot for you? Um, you? The, the pivots when my neighbor got murdered mm. and I because a lot of my other friends who passed away and, and I don't even like saying this but Especially when it comes down to youth drug overdoses and youth suicides your brains just not there mm -hmm. Like you are not a fully developed person yet So the decision making that I made when it comes time to choosing drugs You don't even know what you're really taking mm -hmm. you don't know wh where that drinks gonna take you that that glass you know, where that goes, uh, where these things, a choice to suicide, that, right. that, that is the end. <clears throat> and I hate to say it, but there's a level of choice involved there. Mm -hmm. Where Ryan, my neighbor, someone else took him. Mm -hmm. Someone else decided to do that. And the next year, a boy named Romeo had the same thing happen at a hotel. Someone else took his life. And it got to the point where I was like, innocent kids are dying. Mm -hmm. And no one cares. And literally, I was looking for a hero. I was like, someone's got to come through and save the day. Someone's got to come through and step up. And at the time, I actually was reading All Souls, uh, which was a book that was reflective of my life. Yeah, uh, I read that in grad school. And it was, uh, I actually got my teacher, my senior year of high school, gave it to me as a gift. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that six months later, I'd be living that life. Mm -hmm. um, so this was before teen empowerment you were involved? This is, yeah, this is, this is all right. pre-teen empowerment. Yeah, what led me to that area. Um, 2004 with that murder, I literally, I, I just wanted to get involved. Right. I just didn't want, I was cleaning toilets, I was feeling useless. You were hungry for that connection. I, I yeah. wanted to do something. Uh, and I never knew that it would lead me to be in that position, to be that person that I hoped would come. Mm -hmm. Like I was like, when is, who's gonna do this? Who's gonna come through? Who's gonna step up? Right. Never thought it was gonna be it me. Was you, yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of crazy. I never thought, never thought of myself as a leader. Because you're such an inspiration to so many young people. And as a colleague, you are a fierce uh, leader and it's contagious. Well, thank you, it, 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 it comes from a lot of pain. Yeah. You know, it comes from loss and it comes yeah. from trying to really make the community that people live in now um, not be the same as like what we had to deal with, the kids shouldn't have to deal with. Right. And, and my role is to be for young people what I didn't have, right. what my friends did. If we had a teen empowerment, right. think about the voice, all that, all that frustration, all that, the suicides, the over, this is, I'm screaming for help. Right. I'm, I'm looking for a voice, I'm looking for someone, for acknowledgement. Right. And if you had that opportunity, like Tina Palmer gave, like a lot, like the Media Center gives, like Books of Hope gives, like a lot of these op, awesome op organizations give, and now that we have those, you're seeing things are very different here. Right. Kids feel empowered, feel, yeah. kids feel, there's almost a sense of entitlement here where it's like, no, you, <laughs> you owe me, you better listen to me. And that's good, right. because kids should feel that. You, you, kids are dismissed all the time. Like, right. oh, you don't know yet. You can't vote, you're just gonna vote for skate parks and stuff. But if you ask me, I mean, the adults who vote don't always vote off the best reasons. And young people, when you think about them voting, especially young people who would vote if they lowered their voting age, it's not every young person's gonna vote. Right. You gotta get people who are passionate and care and are informed probably more informed than a lot of adults, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So that's a little background. I could talk about yeah. that story for so, days. <laughs> so, talk about TE like present day in yeah. terms of like your experience that you, you know, found through TE. How are you seeing that in the, in the, in the kind of the programs and events that you all are running? How is that impacting Somerville youth today? Yeah, well, number one, we'll put money in their pockets. Mm -hmm. We pay the youth, uh, value them. Like really be like, hey, what you say, what you're doing, the work you're doing, the things you're passionate about, they matter. And we wanna put money in your pocket for that. Mm -hmm. Cause if we ask adults, if me and you go to a community meeting tonight, I assume you're probably a salaried employee. Uh, yes, I So am. That, that goes with our job, right? Mm -hmm. So we're getting compensated for that. Right. If I have to go to an extra meeting, maybe I can swap my hours or do this and that. Mm -hmm. But then we ask young people to do it and we wanna do it for free. Right. But, but you are the most valuable person in the room. But we don't wanna pay you right. or give you value. So putting value on them, yep. giving them opportunity to use like their voice. Workforce development. Yeah, and, and yeah. just the opportunity to, to be representatives for themselves, to be advocates for themselves. Um, the young people go to these things, they're smart, they know what they're talking right. about. So our program today, we're, we're seeing, uh, we're looking at, uh, we have a mental wellness program. 
Um, so now we go back to the past of all these traumas and tragedies that happened that led us to where we are today. But now we have a, a mental wellness program. When you think about all those kids in those opportunities, if they have the opportunity to connect to the program, learn some skills, right. learn QPR trainings, different things that you can have in your Rolodex, really. Mm -hmm. No one uses that anymore. <laughs> um, the digital Rolodex. Right? So as a teenager, now I have all this equipment. Mm -hmm. So now I know how to support my friends. I know how to support myself. Right. I know to ask for help. There's resources here, but a lot of people don't know where they are or, what, or how to connect to them. Mm -hmm. um, so today is very different from where we were 15 years ago. Today, some of the kids see themselves as leaders. Mm -hmm. They see themselves as thought provokers. They see themselves as people who can challenge authority. Right. Where before it was almost muzzled. It was keep right. it down. Don't talk about that. Don't, don't go there. Um, and it's, it's very, very different today. And there's a lot more opportunities because of that. Yeah. But what's interesting is there's a lot less youth. Actually, I just saw today, I think Somerville has only 2% of our community is 13 to 21. Wow. And that's insane. That's insane. When we really think about yeah. Somerville and Cambridge, a combined population of roughly a quarter million people. There's fewer families or, yeah. or just it, it, reproduction in yeah. general. And, you go yeah. to a Somerville High Rush Cambridge football game, and there's 50 kids between two cities that have a population of 250,000 people. 50 kids. Mm -hmm. Two cities. Wow. Where are they? Hmm. Everett High was built for 1,700 kids, and they have 2,300. Wow. Some of the high, when I went there, had 2,100. Mm -hmm. It was built for 1,800. Now they have 1,200. It is affordability. Affordability. So that's another. So now today, that's one of the big things we're dealing right. with in trying to look. How can kids stay in some of them? Right. The success used to be getting out before. So you have mental health. And then as, as an actual program yep. itself, right? And then what are the other like main yep. programs? So we have one here at the Solon Media Center. Uh, they're creating podcasts. Yep. Uh, they have Youth a, Matters Media. Yep, Youth Matters Media. They're doing Love some it. awesome work uh, with Heather McCormick. Big ups to Heather McCormick. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so we have an outdoor program with my staff, Sean Post. And they actually, they went on a hike this weekend. They went hiking. They went cross-country skiing. That Monadnock is like a big trip yep, for them. Yep, going right? hiking out there. Yeah. And it's cool because it's free. Yep. And most times people, I joke, I'm like, people should pay us to do these programs. Mm -hmm. But we're actually, we don't pay people to do these programs because they're... And that goes right with mental health. And oh, it does. Mental and obviously physical health, but just the, the to get into more open and green space, it's yeah. such a hard um, access here in Somerville that it's, that's yeah. great. And for young people, especially young people of diverse backgrounds, like typically when you go to the mountains, you see white faces. Right. You know, and you go to New Hampshire and like, mm -hmm. who do you see? You're not seeing a diverse range of kids, but if you give them the opportunities, to see themselves in there yeah. and be like, this is for you. Just like our Red Sox game. Right. You go to our Red Sox game, everyone looks like me. I'm Waldo, trying okay. to find me at a Red Sox game. But if you look at the communities that surround Boston and the Red Sox, it's like, well, there's, there's, there's kids of Brazilian background, Haitian background, of all, all types of background, they, they should be there. They're the faces, they're the community. Um, so bring them, but you have to bring them and give them the opportunities. If you don't take we them. We have their photography exhibit on display. I know it's a partnership with the library, but we have some of the work that was done through um, the program from their, from the youth's visit to Mount Mananak on, yeah. on our walls. Yeah, it's, it's pretty. <laughs> it's, and it's great. And it, it's just, it's, it, I love that it's incorporating the content creative side and also documenting while you're out in nature and just also hopefully, you know, being present as yeah. well. But we connected to no trace uh, left behind either. Oh, okay. It's like, what's your impact? Mm -hmm. So we think about when you, your impact on the environment, but so when you move to a community, what's yeah. your impact? Right. So if you move here as a new resident, and one of the things that gets really hot, people think that it's like, oh, you're against new residents. It's like, and that's the furthest thing from the truth because one, our immigrant uh, population is like really what one of the things that makes Somerville the great city it is. But the second part is it's like, it's all about being invested. Right. Yeah, if you move here to a place like Somerville or Brooklyn or San Francisco, wherever it may be, and you come here and you're like, you got change from me, I'm here now. Right. I want this and this, and I'm calling the cops or the kids in the playground and this and that, and I want all these changes for me. Well, yeah, I actually don't want you here. Mm -hmm. But if you're coming here and you're like, hey, there's a community here, there's an identity here, there's people who are from here, yeah. and I want to be a part of this. Mm -hmm. I want to be part of Somerville, right. not I want someone to change for me. Right. Oh, I want you here. Right. Definitely, I want lots of you here because you're going to invest. You're going to make the same bet. Maybe you're going to raise your family here <laughs> you know, if you can Actually, afford it. Yeah, right. right. So, so that's where it gets twisted a lot of times when you're talking about, like, about being from here and like that identity. It's like, oh, so you don't want people out. It's like, nah, that's not necessarily true. It's easy to say that. Right. But when you really think about it, all we're asking for is people to, to know. 
Right. Do a little research. Mm -hmm. And same thing if I moved to another area. It's like, I want to know the of area. Course, yeah. I want to know a little bit of the history. Was this yeah. an industrial area? What were some of the things that made the sea? Well, did they ma manufacture bricks? What were some of those things? Because that, that's history. Right. And that, that's the depth. You really think about some of them, brick bottom, brick manufacturing. This square right here. Mm -hmm. Literally, people's grandparents who live here brick laid these streets. Right. They built some of these houses. So there's a great deal of pride that's in this cool. community. That's yeah. cool. Talk about the Peace Conference as oh. well, because I know that's a yep. annual awesome event that happens at the Somerville Theater. Yep. And so also it's so other venues as well. But yeah, we're hoping this year. We're actually I'm I'm actually trying to work a permit for Somerville High School this year. Uh, right now we're permitted for the East Somerville School. Okay. Uh, for May 9th, um, Saturday How May many 9th. Years has it been? This is going to be our I believe it's going to be our 14th annual. Okay. So yeah, 14th 14. annual. Yep. Peace Conference. What is the Peace Conference? What's so, the goal behind that? The whole idea of Peace Conference, what I talked about earlier about that lack of youth voice. Mm -hmm. It's getting that youth voice. It's mm -hmm. bringing the mayor, the police chief, the city council, the school committee, nonprofit leaders, city agencies, superintendent, bringing them all into the room to listen to youth. Right. To listen to their stories through theater, through music, through spoken word, through speeches, through content through whatever they see as a way of mobile that they can express themselves and talk about. And you go back to what I was saying earlier, lack of self-expression, lack of voice led to this kind of muzzled feeling that may led towards people choosing other paths that, right. that are permanent. And when you give these opportunities and you're seeing the same kid who you might have written off and they're up there giving a speech and it's like, yeah, actually there's some opportunities Powerful. I can come here and this kid's a leader. Right. Um, and that's one of the difficulties that sometimes happens with our work because we work with some of them kids. So some of them are high risk and some of them aren't. Mm -hmm. So I've had people say, oh, why are you working with that kid? He's, a, he's trouble. I'm like, well, but if that kid can be involved and get, get some kids who are gang involved, come into our program, maybe get, get in the head a little bit, start to work with it. It's like, you know, we, we work with some of them kids. So sometimes they aren't students. Sometimes they're kids who have dropped out of school. But sometimes it gets mixed up where people are like, well, this kid's really good and they're a good thing for the program. But I'm like, some, that kid is going to be successful whether they're here or not. Right. And it's also just believing in someone's ability yeah. and giving them the opportunity. And what's yeah. going to benefit this kid and the community? Because mm -hmm. like, hey, well, if I engage this young man or young lady um, and they're able to feel engaged and feel empowered, then it's like, well, guess what? Well, that kid in three years could have been a person in the crime block. Right. But instead, no, they're a person participating in youth police dialogues right. and training officers and doing basketball tournaments. Um, and, and that's, that's huge, yeah. the, the relationships that you all have um, really like fostered and, and, and created with the police department here. Yeah. And so much. Talk a little bit about that and also talk about how that has also been highlighted recently in a special collaborative exhibit in yeah. D.C. Great transition, Erica. Which is awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, talk a little bit about, about the program here locally and then how, how that also manifested into the D.C. exhibit. Great. So we've been doing, teen empowerment has been doing youth police work for over 20 years now. We like to mark ourselves as experts in youth police relationships and how to get into the nitty-gritty of actually looking into um, what, what matters when it comes time to those relationships. And we've been doing that in Boston for a number of years, but we brought that same work here into Somerville. Mm -hmm. And here in Somerville, over the years, um, because the mayor is a big supporter of youth police dialogues and, and police accountability, um, we've always had the ear of the police chief. Yeah. But over the past five years, I gotta give Chief Fallon a lot of credit um, and a lot of props, mm -hmm. because it's not just that he's being told work with teen empowerment. Right. He comes up with ideas himself. Uh, he's a thought leader. Uh, I'm actually my biggest fear for Chief Fallon is that one day some big police department's gonna be like, "This guy's awesome." Mm -hmm. Like some major city is gonna be like, "We want you." So don't leave. <laughs> Fortunately, he's a Somerville guy. Got some family here, so yeah. um, we should be able to keep him. But um, the leadership in the police department actually believes in in the work we're trying to do. And that's huge. And, and some of that is when rookies, police officers, come onto the street is having them come in their first two weeks on the job meeting with us, mm -hmm. having a dialogue section with the young people, building focus on relationships. Right. It's not focus on criticisms or, or being like, youth do this and police do that. That's not what it's about. It's about getting to know the individuals. Right. Um, and it, establishing trust, like going back to that, like getting to know your, your yeah. local officer uh, who's on foot, right? And yep. Yeah. If we know each other by name, we treat each other very differently. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, when we have relationships with each other, it's a lot more accountability. Right. Um, so then when you do have that stop on the street, you know each other, and you know each other by first name. Right. That matters. It's not, excuse me, well, so what's your badge number? Right. Right here. Right. Read it. It's a human-to-human -human connection. It's, hey, Tony. Right. You can't do that, and I know your supervisor, too. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. Just an example. We have had no bad instances with anybody <laughs> named Tony. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so um, so we've been doing walking dialogues with the police, um, rookie trainings, 
uh, we do a basketball game, and part of the basketball game is that um, in this year in particular, we want all the officers who want to play in the game to meet with the youth beforehand and do a relationship session uh, beforehand because it's it can look great on the court and it's a great photo op, but if it's just the game, you don't remember that person. Sure. You get the relationships to me. Now I'm passing you the ball. I'm like, Erica, I'm passing you the ball. Right. You know, you kind of have those things. So that's come a long way. Um, and in that work, uh, we built a ton of relationships within the department, uh, and we're seeing a lot of things shift. I, I remember I went recently to a training in Cambridge, and, and a lieutenant from Cambridge was like, seeing things shift. He's like, people used to come in to a solid police department for a theft, and they leave with a black eye. Wow. He's like, you don't see that anymore. And I'm like, you're damn right. right. And actually, that'd be something if that was still happening. I, you know, we have some, yeah. we have a lot more work yeah. to do. Um, so in the work, we, we've been training dozens of officers. We're working with them. And it actually um, got picked up by um, the National Law Enforcement Museum. Wow. They actually heard about the work we've been doing because it's, it's really nitty gritty. It's, it's, it's the work. And it's really Yeah, and it's, it's stuff that not a lot of people are willing to do. Right. Sit down, talk one-on-one -on -one with the cop, brainstorm issues that you face, that we face. Right. What can we do about it? And challenge each other. If people are saying things that are kind of off, having that conversation. Right. What do we need to do to address this? How, how do we have to look at these negative attitudes? It's not to say it's perfect either, because it's all, police sure. departments are there's a, made up of individuals. It's all a work in progress, but you have put in so much work, you and your colleagues, to lay down the foundation, Exa and that's huge. Exactly, and same thing with young people too, though. Like Not every young person that works through us is always going to have the best relationships with police. Some will maybe the kids that they get in trouble. Right. But again, for the police to understand that that's actually a benefit, mm -hmm. that even if this young person got in trouble, but you know who they are in right. the level of engagement just different when you're able to do that right. so now we're actually um, Somerville um, is featured with I believe it's Charlton South Carolina Chicago Dallas Cleveland and Somerville that's great so we're the only city with less than 100,000 people <laughs> uh, every one, other one is a major US city right. and we have a wall Wow. It's an absolute. This is in Washington, In Washington, D.C. National Law Enforcement Museum? Yep. Yep. Very it's, cool. uh, it's huge. It's, it's right near the National Mall, um, walking distance from all the other Smithsonian's museums. They do charge those now, like the Smithsonian's are free. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a wicked interactive museum. Wow. Like, you can solve crimes. You can be a 911 dispatcher. I know we're having pictures on the screen right now as well. We're showcasing all this awesome and it's, stuff. <laughs> but the five communities room, I walked in, I couldn't believe it. Wow. I was like, I knew we did it. But seeing, it was huge. It was huge. And it's on a national platform. Yeah. And so many other people are able to experience this, which is huge. So I walked in and started taking selfies with myself. <laughs> and then uh, I had to. Uh, and then so, and someone walks in. And it was like, it was actually the day, it was the day or two after Christmas. So it was really quiet. Like DC was dead. Um, and someone walked in. And I'm like, they're like, they're like, is that you? I'm like, yeah, this is surreal. <laughs> like, That's so I cool. never thought I could, like, really go back to what I was saying in the beginning. Yeah. I was a custodian. I was working at my, I was cleaning toilets when I was 21, and I and I was a drop off college, and I, I kind of thought that that's the projection of my life and where I was gonna go, mm -hmm. and then to be 15 years later, be like a leader in the community, and in a museum. You should be proud. It's, it, 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 I think you are proud, but that is that whoa kind of moment where you are. You yeah, are you're like whoa, I made it. You're like you're like yeah, I I, I actually I, I've made it. I, I'm I, you can be like I'm successful. Um, awesome. And I never thought that. Like, I didn't think I'd be alive at this age, um, let alone. Well, we're really happy you are. Me too. <laughs> Me too. I love it. I feel it. very, very fortunate to have gotten to know you um, in being a transplant here <laughs> from, I, to Somerville. You are the, one of the greatest. That's what we need. We need transplants like you. <laughs> like, really, they come here, you're invested. You want to learn. You want to know more. Um, and that makes me want you here even more. Yeah. You know it's what I mean? It's hard to not, at least, you know, in terms of going back to, like, activist roots and just all of the work that we're doing, you know, respectively in our organizations is, is so much community building and, yeah. and relationship building and just, you know, not ignoring all the issues that are going on and trying to figure out ways that little by little, you know, you could have an impact. And, and storytelling is huge, which is also why you're here yeah. <laughs> today, right, to, to talk up about who you are. Um, before we close up, what are what are some, you know, just ways folks out there who are watching can can learn more about TE, Teen Empowerment, or get involved in your programs, um, 
upcoming events that people can check out any of yeah. those sorts of things oh we uh, so we have a series of movie nights coming up we have a series of actually uh, collaborations with brooklyn boulders taking Ooh. kids hiking over oh, nice. uh, rock, rock climbing mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't happen and there's just different forms of leadership different forms of mental health yeah. different opportunities so if you want to connect with tina palmer uh, we're obviously on the web right. uh, tina palmer.org because we're an organization mm -hmm. um, you can always find us we're on facebook we're on instagram we're on all the tina palmer mm -hmm. um, and i mumble so that's Teen empowerment for those of you that <laughs> my sum of a mumble drags to. Um, so yeah, on the web is a really easy way to access us. Uh, where we have a city extension, we're at 617-625-6600, extension 2256. Cool. Uh, we can be reached there. Um, and like I said, social media, email, um, a number of platforms, and people can volunteer. They can attend events. Uh, I really encourage people to attend events, see yeah. actually what it looks Experience like. Experience, yeah. Cool. That's awesome. Um, and last but not least. A fun fact about you, one that I personally really love and enjoy. Um, what do you like to do when you're not at work? What, what is one of your um, passion projects? Ooh, so um, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm hooking. I here. love. <laughs> so I'm, um, you know, I'm obviously on TV. I don't gonna say this. So my career is taking a, a turn at this stage of my life. Uh -huh. um, obviously, I'm not leaving my organization. I have no plans to leave anytime soon. We have a strategic plan that I'm committed to. Yeah. Um, but I love tourism. Uh -huh. I love tourism and I love showing off my community and I love teaching people about Somerville in Boston. So one of my fun, fun, survive, uh, si fun fact, side fact, <laughs> is that my brother and I, um, actually his, his girlfriend and, and him started uh, a thing called Townie Tours. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a major part of that. Um, and we actually do walking tours of the city of Somerville in Davis Square. That's great. Uh, we charge people. We're, we're on the web, we're on the Boston calendar, townietours.com. Nice. Um, and I have my, um, my alias, as Boston Dan, and Boston Dan is a YouTuber. Uh -huh. um, I feel weird speaking about that in a third person, actually. <laughs> Let me step away from that. You're very entertaining. Um, but yeah, I, I, I ride a pedicab in Boston. So I, I do Boston pedicab, I do walking tours in Somerville. Um, I love to talk about history, I love to talk about the Industrial Revolution, I love to talk about the gang wars of the 60s. So cool. um, really talk about how we ended up here today, how did the potato famine impact us, mm -hmm. how did all these different things, the molasses flood, all these different things that, uh, Boston riots, all these things that impact the sum of one Boston that we need today and talk about in a historical sense uh, and make it fun because the whole idea is that of town shows, everyone, people are here making big money off some of them. Mm -hmm. Everyone's moving here, they're paying a lot to be here, know the community that you're coming right. to. So it's our way of actually marketing ourselves yeah. and be like, well, we're from here. And every time people come to Boston, they want like a Goodwill Hunting to give right. them a tour. And then they meet, <laughs> and it means someone from some other town that they claim they're from Boston. And obviously some of us not Boston, so you're it. You're, but we're you're, it. You're the localized <laughs> flavor for a really unique experience. Oh, it's tour. so unique. I from biking it. tours on pedicabs I to walking it. tours in Somerville. I'm signing up. Follow me on YouTube, <laughs> Instagram, Boston.Dan, <laughs> Facebook, Boston Dan, Twitter. I don't really use it, but it's fine. I'm on there. I love it. I love it. Thank you for promoting that because I think that's a really cool. I will be shameless. It's fine. And Townie Tours also. Good. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Um, Danny, it is a pleasure, my friend. Thank you for, for coming in. Thank you. Um, and yeah, like he shared, please uh, check out the, the website for Teen Empowerment. Um, and all the different social media platforms you can check out. And yeah, if you're looking for a unique insider tour of Somerville, this is your guy. So Danny, high five. Thank you for coming on. On that note, America Jones, and we are out. See you later. <laughs>